Hi, the Joy of Football podcast has an end of season vibe about it today. Martin Tyler and I discuss the eight Premier League clubs who have parted company with their manager since the beginning of the season and the directors of football they haven't parted with and who never talk to the media and the structures of these football clubs and why are they like they are and why aren't they being challenged more. Then we go on to Martin's letter from the gantry which is the... Premier League playoff final uh, from the Championship, Southampton versus Leeds. And into three, not of the best, but the three best, the three promoted teams from the Championship and the three worst, the three relegated teams from the Premier League. That then takes us on to three of the best, as we like to call it. Martin makes it pay. And those are young player, old player, and general player and we finish off in stoppage time with just one of the greatest moments in football this season the joy of football podcast with me neil barnett and with me martin tyler looks like Charlie. ready The joy of football. Hello, hello. The joy of football, the greatest addiction in the world, reaches its 10th milestone podcast today. No flowers yet, not needed. Martin Tyler, the voice of the Premier League and so much more. Sky Sports, Premier League TV and the whole globe. And meet Neil Barnett, uh, over 30 years working inside Chelsea and 14 years on radio in the United States Sirius XM FC. Right, let's go, let's go. We have had a couple of responses to our discussions about VAR that I just want to bring you. For, this is from the YouTube uh, the YouTube messages. Uh, one says uh, that this is from Chronicles of Callum. Says changes I'd make to VAR. Ref can request VAR replay if unsure, but Stockley Park can't request reviews themselves. Each manager has three challenges per game. If challenge is upheld, it isn't lost. Refs are mic'd up and conversation with Stockley Park can be heard by TV audience. Replays at side of pitch aren't shown in slow motion. And a similar one uh, from uh, Nobby Wright says, uh, on-field reviews uh, by three per captain. Um, St- Stockley Uh, just technical crew supplying what is required no jobs for the boys Martin Tyler Uh, similar similar views there well certainly about the slow motion replays uh, there's no question that they do distort the if you like the level of violence in challenges and uh, I do think what you see with the naked eye you should see repeated with the um, with the normal speed replays that, that that's something we've been going on about in television for 30 years really that included as a commentator before VAR was even thought of I always wanted to see the replays in normal speed on contentious incidents mm. and sometimes that happened yeah I always felt sorry for goalkeepers he should have got down to that no it was a bullet <laughs> Well, in the end, um, VAR is now going to be debated, which uh, I think is an interesting concept. Maybe some good will come out of that. I hope so, because I still think it has value. Um, but as we said before, it's when to intervene and when not to. The last game that I did in the Premier League was Jurgen Klopp's farewell game at Liverpool against Wolves, who brought this motion. And they had a player, Nelson Semedo, sent off on a VAR review. He got a yellow card and that was... Uh, downgraded or upgraded I was never quite sure which which way to go in that I said to to a red card and I think I thought it was a red card offence but it wasn't seen by that as the on-field referee and I think Gary O'Neill had a point where he said should we be doing looking at that just to add extra punishment no one was really hurt in the incident just play on yellow card and um, those are the sort of things that are being debated and, and Wolves are leading the way in that respect so but definitely Normal speed replays show you something about what happened, not a, a slightly 
ordinary um, the slow motion is so ordinary it's, we accept it now I don't think we should accept it no and in tennis when they they have uh, looking to see if a ball's in court or out of court it's, it is a thrilling moment for the crowd but it's something that you know is only going to take a short time I love the idea of no Stockley Park intervention and interventions from managers or captains I think it should be the captain I think it should be somebody on the pitch <laughs> not somebody off the pitch the game is somebody about on players the making a decision <laughs> We're giving far too much power to managers, which is why we should only have three substitutes a game and not five. Well, that's, that's, that's for another time. We're going to start off today by talking about managers. By the way, if you want to send in any messages, you can, of course, do it on YouTube. You can also email us, the joys of football podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you because we've started out really having a bit of fun ourselves. And if you're enjoying it, we need to know it if you think we can concentrate on different aspects of it we'd like to know that as well so feedback is a very um, modern way to do it every time you go anywhere i checked out of a hotel and i for the liverpool game um how many marks would you give us out of 10 i was just paying the bill <laughs> And I thought, well, give me a couple of days to think about it and I might do something online. But everybody wants feedback. And so we're in a position now we're asking for feedback as well. And it's not just that. We are a couple of old farts who talk about <laughs> nothing but football. So uh, yeah, it's just true. enjoyable. It's yeah. just enjoyable. Yeah. Right. Talking football. Um, mm. Eight clubs in the Premier League have changed their manager since the start of the season. Going down in order of finish, Liverpool, of course, uh, Jurgen Klopp said goodbye through fatigue and that Slot is taking over. Chelsea and Pochettino, if you believe what you read in the media, have said goodbye by mutual consent. West Ham, same with David Moyes and Lopetegui's coming in to take over. Crystal Palace said goodbye to Roy Hodgson as form dipped and brought in Oli Glasner. And, Bright and Roy's own health as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Brighton uh, uh, were left by De Zerbi, if you believe uh, the way it's put. Uh, Nottingham Forest uh, ditched Steve Cooper and brought in uh, the manager with the greatest name of any manager in history, <laughs> Nuno Espirito Santo. Uh, would he be such an in-demand manager if he was called Bill Smith? I don't know. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the amazing things about him, he is one of the very few Premier League managers who was a goalkeeper. Yeah. They are a, a very yeah. rare species. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so well done to Nuno, who's, um, at, what's his third job in the Premier League? Yeah. Yeah. Burnley, of course, Vincent Company's left and gone to Bayern Munich. Uh, and Sheffield United, Paul Heckenbottom got... Uh, sat and Chris Wilder got recalled. Uh, eight changes. But were three only three of those during the season? Yeah. Yeah. So that's remarkable, really. At the end of the season, we're getting back to maybe what's always happened in, in European football and maybe elsewhere around the world as well. You serve a term, really, and you expect that when you go in Iraola at Bournemouth. is amazed he's got a two-year deal because all his previous coaching, it was the season, and then yeah. see what happens. So um, maybe we're getting towards that but there is an unusual number of a high percentage of that leaving at the end of the campaign yep and and of course there may be one or two more in the near future we'll wait uh, on that but the point is that i need to bring up with you here is a lot of these decisions are made by or in league with directors of football uh and we never hear from directors of football and there seems to be more and more clashes between managers and directors of football and there seems to be more and more power going to manage, uh, directors of football or owners Sir Jim Ratcliffe uh, owners uh, uh, Badad Egbali and, and it, it really is becoming a different game and if you go through the directors of football at most clubs most of them aren't common names no, uh, and, and even worse, a Premier League manager has to, in agreement with the broadcasting money that comes in, give a pre-match and post-match press conference for every league game. So that's 76 uh, press conferences per season. Now, on top of that, if you're in Europe, you've got to do one pre and post as well. Uh, and obviously for the FA Cup and Carabao Cup, although those sometimes the assistants mm. are put out. Directors of football don't talk. We never hear from them. But we don't ask for them. 
And I, I just do wonder, all the time. Yeah, well, you're a one-off, Neil, as this podcast is showing. Um, but the truth is that there's been no um, uh, attempts, really, to get the directors of football, sporting directors, call them what you will, to come in and explain. Now, Jim Ratcliffe, in the last 24 hours before this podcast, has let it be known that um, uh, Jason Wilcox will be shaping the team and the philosophy of the team will be through Jason Wilcox. So as a journalist and a commentator, I would want to be able to speak to Jason Wilcox and if a game goes well, to praise him and if a game goes badly, um, to criticize him as, as happens to the managers. But what is shaping the team? Um, the philosophy of the team say, all right, we're gonna play from the back, we're gonna play through the lines, we're gonna have a passing philosophy. But does it stop there? Um, hang on a minute, I don't like the way you're defending as the manager, so um, I want zonal defending, not man-for-man -man marking. Um, I want the system of play to be 4-3-3, 3-4-3, whatever. Um, is, does that come under the director of football's remit? What is left for the coach and what is left? And the players are going to be provided by the director of football as well. Well, what they so, said was that the manager, the coach um, can ask for positions... Uh, and will then be given three alternatives. This is Manchester United we're talking about. I'm not yep. saying everybody's doing the same. Uh, three alternatives for mm. the position, and he can choose which one he'd prefer. But but it's uh, I I have I have some close friends who are um, not normal and are addicted to cycling, uh, the the sport of cycling. Uh, and Ineos and Sir Jim Ratcliffe took over the famous Sky cycling team which was the best team in the world and was winning trophies and 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 tour de france and goodness knows what olympic golds and everything and it's not gone well and one of the reasons it's not gone well has been the interference or the part taken in decision making depending on which way you look at it by ineos and sir jim ratcliffe and well he he's bought into the club so he's entitled to make these decisions I, I'm a bit surprised they've come out maybe he didn't want them to come out maybe it's been leaked I don't know there will all be sort of political factions around old Manchester United and new Manchester United we know these things happen we're realistic in that respect but it's putting down a method of operation which most big businesses have um, but football is is different in that most big businesses the competition takes place uh, on a financial basis not on a sporting field you know so we're now they're not going to be called managers I believe Unai Emery's new deal has called him head coach and not a manager is, is that right he's just signed a long deal and thoroughly deserves it as well so he's accepting he's coming from a dis system whereby he'll accept it will the lights did Pochettino leave Chelsea because he didn't want to be dictated to by the current sporting directors there. But they work for the owners. So that it is something that I think the manager or head coach is going to be caught in the middle of all this. You can't change the players because of the contractual situation. Um, you're not going to change the sporting directors because they're employed by the bosses. So they're but, their but men. But they're not held So it only leaves the head coach who's accountable. But they're not held accountable. Well, they for will their be. Mistakes. I think they will be. I think that's the difference. I think you've made a really good point, Neil. I think now we've got to. I mean, there's some good people on this list. We've Hang on, got, just before just before you give it to us, yeah. I want to ask you a question. Do you think Eric Ten Hag knew who Jason Wilcox was? Well, he should do. Jason Wilcox won the Premier League as a player so in Jason, 1995. Yeah, but that's still something he can't help his age. That's no, the way no, his career path saying, is going. I'm just saying he's got no it, history in management since. He then. worked for Manchester City. He worked for obviously for a brief time for Southampton. He's well thought of within the game, and he has a pedigree. I would like to ask Jason Wilcox, why didn't you want to become a manager? Mm. Oh, actually, look at the lifespan of managers at, at clubs very short it's much more secure but look Simon Francis at Bournemouth Edu of course at Arsenal who had an outstanding playing career with the club Simon Francis played for ages for Bournemouth I'm um, looking down David Weir at Brighton you know is a, a Scottish international uh, an excellent Dougie Freeman I think did have a spell as caretaker manager of Crystal Palace so he would understand the job well, he's he, managed he's, he's yeah he's really well he's really well thought the of divisions a lot. Um, the new Liverpool um, sporting director Richard Hughes was a was a decent player and had a spell 
well, actually, in Italy. A um, really good bloke who I know, Mick Harford. I mean, Luton. yeah, it speaks for himself, really. And uh, for Luton, although they're obviously not in the Premier League anymore. Uh, Chiki Begiristein was a good player at Manchester City. He was a sporting director. Um, Dan Ashworth is an interesting one because he, he has been involved at various different levels. And he's going to go to Manchester United, we believe, with gardening leave sorted out or some deal done. In fact, transfer fees between sporting directors Tell, between clubs for sporting directors, I think Jason Wilcox was involved in one of those. Um, he's the, he's uh, the one English sporting director who has built uh, uh, built uh, a work, a piece of work in sporting directing that makes him yeah. attractive. But what is that work, and and why are we talking about it? Because it's different. Mm. Because Alec Ferguson would not have countenanced a sporting director. Uh, Arsene Wenger was well, you was say all those he wouldn't things. have done, but the great thing about Alex Ferguson was the way that he uh, responded to age, time, and new methods. And I don't actually agree with you on that. Well, he I had think... David Gill, who could have been. Da yeah. David Gill was never called the sporting director, but he did that role. Yeah. He he worked from the from the ownership. To the, but he was the answerable dressing. to the manager as much as the manager was answerable yes, to him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now the managers, the head coaches, well, we, we have to stop mm. calling them managers. The head coaches have to manage upwards to the sporting directors. And I, the, the one thing that I think comes out of this, and there's nothing wrong with the system, it's obviously the way football wants to go forward and, and the industry is entitled to do this. But it is the, the, what you touched on, the accountability. Yeah. I think there's got to be more accountability. I don't, I don't think they're not speaking to us. I just don't think we asked to speak well, to them. Well, I don't think that's true. I mean, the one guy who constantly comes out and talks to the media off the record is Edu. Yes, uh, uh, but he won't actually talk but on the record. In, he talked but, in the in the Arsenal documentaries. Yeah, and, and, and I, we learned a lot it, about him. I think Edu's that. the most accessible uh, yeah, in, in that sense. Uh, there was a spell, of course. But are my, you chasing Simon Francis to get on board with you? You're not. You no, know? But, and, but there was a spell, and, I, and he, he 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 could answer all these questions from his point of view, and and, and their ownership of decide. I think there's actually an extra person coming in to sit alongside Simon Francis, but. These guys have obviously accepted there is a there is a job in football caused by the fact there's money in the Premier League. You won't find them in lower lower levels of football, the directors of football. No, because... I think also, Martin, I think that the one manager who changed football in terms of managers, not on the pitch, was Jose Mourinho. And he turned management into a twenty four hour, seven day a week job with your with your uh, uh, research of data, your scouting of the opposition, your preparation of training, specifically with match play uh, 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 methods uh, coming into it, and it became a it became required in a way that you needed a director of of, of football to do the other bits of the old manager. Yeah, but not to sack you. No, exactly. In no. in many ways, the director of football should be working for the manager but the managers become the head coach i do not believe when you change your head coach as you said you get a job for a year year in year out that you enhance your team i think that you i think that you set your team back uh if you uh, i mean it, i'm also interested that pochettino's been uh, let go by chelsea uh and it looks as though uh, maresca is coming in um, and I'm just, I'm just, and they're talking about young people, uh, new ideas. But I'm looking at the coaches who have done well this year. Carlo Ancelotti won La Liga <laughs> again, age 64, in and the Champions League Pep, final yeah. for the sixth time. Pep Guardiola won uh, Premier League again, age 53. Gian Piero Gasparini won the Europa League, age 66. Uh, Jose Luis uh, uh, Mendelebar having won the Europa League last season with Sevilla, now wins the conference with yeah. Olympiakos, the first time for, they've Greek, ever done Greek it, for Greek uh, football, age yeah. 63. And so we go on. Yeah, Xabi Alonso, the new kid on the block, age 42. But there aren't many of them. Simone Inzaghi's just won the league for the first time, uh, Serie A, yeah, 48. Pep, Pep works with Bagiristan very closely, and so that's been in place yeah. for ages now. Yeah. So I don't think... I mean, it's, it's the Manchester United model, the fact that we've been privileged... 
to hear what the the new man is going, the new owner is going to um, is going to impose on the uh, on the structure of football, and we'll see what happens. All I would ask, as somebody who loves the game passionately, is can we discuss it with these guys? And I don't think that, that deliberately people are saying no, you can't. Nobody's asked. I, I can't. I well, I mean, we've got different points of view on this. Yeah. I'm gonna. I know Jason Wilcox because I was there the day they won the Premier League in 1995 um, when they got the, well, the Manchester United, in fact, helped them win the Premier League on that last day when they were beaten at Anfield. But they were part of a great team, a uh, great part of Premier League history. So let's see, let, let's make it more transparent. Uh, football, if there's one word that um, and I've been lucky enough to be around this wonderful game for, for decades, the one thing that I always wanted is total transparency, and I think there's there's a wish for that from within the industry, and now they can prove it. Yeah, let's let's hear once this is um, the the new manager or Eric Ten Hag is confirmed as the manager, then let's hear from the sporting director. Yes, right. Uh, it's been a wonderful week for young managers, however. Uh, and you finished up watching one achieve promotion. I did. This is Martin Tyler's letter from the gantry. Back in action after missing an episode, but um, we explained that. Here we go. Uh, it was only five hours from kickoff when I received a phone call from a former Sky Sports colleague offering me a ticket to the championship playoff final at Wembley. Despite the need to get a move on, it was too good a chance to turn down. The prize of Premier League football for the winner says it all about the pull of the fixture. And more than that, Leeds United versus Southampton had a real ring of personal history for me. My first regular job as a commentator was for Yorkshire Television, based in Leeds. Ellen Road was on my beat for five years between 1976 and 1981. This was soon after their inspirational manager, Don Reavy, had left to take charge of England. And in truth, it wasn't a golden period for the club. But they were the only top division side in the Yorkshire television area for that period, though Middlesbrough had a shared status with Tyne Tees Television based up in Newcastle. The likes of Billy Bremner, Norman Hunter, Alan Clark and Eddie Gray all played in my first Leeds game in the job, but one by one the legends drifted away. Southampton took me back even further to my very first commentary, December the 28th, 1974. The Saints at home to another club, I would soon be spending plenty of time with in my Yorkshire years, Sheffield Wednesday. It was a second division fixture, the level of course that Southampton have just risen from. For Russell Martin now, read Laurie McMenemy back then. On my debut, Sheffield Wednesday won 1-0 at Southampton's quaint but very atmospheric old ground, the Dell. There was no fixed commentary gantry. I was perched at the back of the director's box. Remember, it was mid-season, December the 28th. Sheffield Wednesday did not win another league game in that campaign. 17 matches. Hard to believe, but true. Southampton, on the other hand, were building a side that less than 80 months later would shock the football world, winning the FA Cup in May 1976 as a club from the second tier, against the mighty Manchester United, no less, at the Old Wembley. 1-0, just as it came to pass in May 2024. For Adam Armstrong now, read Bobby Stokes 48 years earlier. Also hard to believe, even for me today, I travelled to Wembley in 1976 on the Southampton team bus. Back then, ITV, my employers and BBC went head to head on their FA Cup final broadcast. It's similar now, but decades ago it was far more competitive, a real ratings war. Back in the 70s and 80s, ITV had one very special gimmick on cup final day, the camera on the coach covering the leaving from Team Hotel and the arrival along Wembley Way, and depending on the technical equipment, various linked points on the journey in between. The camera needed a reporter, and I was deemed suitable by Laurie McMenemy to be that privileged person in 1976. I did have a little bit of previous the year before with Fulham, when a famous member of their squad, as the bus pulled away from their hotel, shouted with the nation watching and listening, get the lagers out, lads. He was joking, I think. I managed to go live with some interviews on my ride to Wembley with Southampton, and I'm sure there was plenty of optimism with the players, but it was an extraordinary victory. 
And I completed my weekend with them by getting their star player, Mick Shannon, and the scoring hero, Bobby Stokes, out of bed early the next morning to appear on ITV's follow-up show, How the Cup Was Won. Lots of makeup required for heavy-eyed Southampton heroes. So Southampton were to win at Wembley again this year. And thanks to my pal, I was there to see it and even managed to park at such short notice, though it meant my steps for the day had a considerable increase. You had to be outside the event zone. I fell for Leeds. They had more of the ball. That's quite an achievement against Russell Martin's possession-based team. And they could count themselves unlucky on the day. Southampton's one-time woking goalkeeper, Alex McCarthy, kept a clean sheet. And the three centre-backs, Taylor Harwood Bellis, Jan Bednarek and Jack Stevens were outstanding. You could say the Saints, rather than marching in, as their song goes, had gone marking in back to the Premier League. There had been an example of how to do it 24 hours earlier. Then I had been Wembley at Wembley as a commentator and with a parking space and described how Manchester United had overturned the odds and Manchester City with organisation, diligence and determination. They also managed to score one of the FA Cup final's craziest ever goals and also one of its slickest. We all love goals, and this has been a record-breaking campaign in that respect. But the last two domestic matches, both with silverware at stake, produced timely reminders and rewards for the value of proper defending. And unlike in May 1976, the Saints and United were both winners at Wembley. Was the Fulham guy who shouted, get the lagers out, lads, Alan Mullery? No, and I'm not prepared to go any further than that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed because it's the kind of thing he would have done. Oh, yeah. uh, he, he must be knocking, he's 80, I think, now, Alan Mullery, and still does um, uh, hospitality at yeah. Brighton. Well, don't be so yeah. shocked at people in their late uh, 70s. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but he's a big personality, yeah. Um, so was the other one at Fulham, uh, who lifted a trophy that no other Englishman's ever lifted, uh, English man. Um, yeah. Right, let's move on, uh, because we're going to build on this, what you've just talked about, with a special one-off, three of the best. Three of the best, he's made them pay, and that completes a wonderful hat-trick. And the three of the best that we're talking about are the three clubs who've got promoted from the Championship mm -hmm to uh, the Premier League. Let me just give you the top of the championship uh, for this season that's just f finished. Remember, it's 46 games. Leicester champions with 97 points. Ipswich runners-up uh, automatically promoted with 96. Leeds, who haven't been promoted because they lost the playoff, uh, third with 90 points. Southampton, fourth with 87 points. Um, my feeling about Leicester... Martin is that they shouldn't have gone down so they should have come up yeah I think it was one of those it can't really happen it was the absolute uh, polar opposite of um, they can't win the league <laughs> and they did <laughs> um, so in, in a way they have sort of defied the odds in both directions um, but the, listen the parachute payments are still there as well um, there are issues involving Leicester with um, potential financial indiscretions when they were in the Premier League last well, time, which that, that's got to be dealt with as well. Um, but still getting a promotion and, and winning, actually winning the league to get promoted is a special achievement. So losing their coach, Enzo Maresca, by the look of it as we mm. talk. Um, but but the, the big issue for me is going to be the previous season when they got relegated, Jamie Vardy wasn't an automatic starter as, as his... Uh, age moved up towards 40 years old he was a regular starter in the championship and got the goals back mm -hmm. but I can't see him doing that in the Premier League again they've got to find a way of scoring well goals. that's the issue about play and Adam Armstrong and Southampton struggled to score goals in the, in the Premier League in their relegation season and has had a fantastic season in the championship including the including the Wembley winner of course in the, the extra three games you have to play to get up by that route um, and it's different management, obviously how these players are going to be used and what recruitment can be done. Of course, if you go up via the playoff route, you lose two weeks. Um, Leicester and Ipswich knew a couple of weeks ago that they were going to be promoting. They will be doing their business behind the scenes, I'm sure. And you're late on parade. You can't really gamble. I suppose deals can be put in place if we do get promoted through the playoffs and maybe some of those will be activated now. Uh, and uh, Ipswich 
who I think was the greatest achievement, mm. obviously, because it's a double promotion, mm. so you weren't expecting them, and they didn't have the parachute payments mm. to uh, to be so competitive. Uh, Kieran McKenna yeah. uh, becoming in demand, uh, I think he's done the sensible thing. Like, for me, uh, you learn your trade as a coach, and that's what Xabi Alonso did with three years in Real Sociedad B before he went to buy a Leverkusen and in many ways Kieran McKenna did that uh, as an assistant and is now learning his trade and people talk about going right back about Brian Clough and his time at Derby and his time at Nottingham Forest and his not so great times in between at Leeds and Brighton people don't talk that he learned his trade at Hartlepool United where I think he won a promotion didn't he as he a, drove as a the team manager. bus as well yeah, yeah. he did everything <laughs> he learned a lot about life yeah and I think Kieran McKenna would be attracted, particularly if Manchester United became available, um, because his time there and he will have roots in that part of uh, football's um, geography. But I, I think it's the right thing to stay. And we're going to mention him a bit later, but Vincent Company um, got up, got relegated, and has gone to Bayern Munich. <laughs> so um, the relegation, if, and I'm not saying for one moment that Ipswich will be relegated, but they know they'll have to fight hard to stay in the Premier League. Um, but it's not a career catastrophe if the same manager um, who does all the great work to get the club in there in the first place actually can't keep them up there. Uh, I just want to mention uh, what I think has been a brilliant decision by Leeds, uh, having lost the playoff is to keep Daniel Fark as mm. their manager and not say you didn't get a promotion, you're out. Mm. Well, that's uh, you, it happens, doesn't it? We've seen so many issues of, of clubs looking and saying, well, your target was to do this, you haven't done it, you've gone. But I go back to our earlier topic, you know, what, how are you running your football club? What kind of loyalties do you see? Will a, an instant change of head coach immediately produce a different reaction from the same players? Um, that's a, people take that that policy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And and just a word on the three clubs that were actually relegated from the uh, Championship down to League One: mm. uh, Birmingham, who were in the uh, Premier League. Mm, a good while ago now about yeah. 12 13 years yeah. ago uh, and of course managed by Wayne Rooney for a period of the season Huddersfield who were in the Premier League I think until 5 years ago uh, 4 years ago and Rotherham who I don't think have ever been in the top flight never, never. in the Premier no, League no. yeah uh, there you go um Right, uh, we go from three of the best to the three worst, a one-off. <laughs> and these are the relegated teams from the Premier League. And remember, not relegated were Everton, who finished 15th uh, on 40 points, having been docked eight. Uh, and Nottingham Forest, who finished one above the relegation zone, 17th on 32 points, having been docked six. So the three relegated teams were actually a little bit more uh, separated from the clubs above them mm. than results. Uh, uh, realistically, the results would have left them. Uh, Luton, uh, from the 38 games, 26 points. Burnley, 24. Sheffield United, 16. Mm. A measly 16. I think a lot of sympathy for Luton um, because they tried to win every game they played certainly they were uh, of the three teams they were probably the best watch in terms of aggression and ambitious football and that's not to undermine Vincent Company's philosophy to try and get Burnley to play their way into becoming a regular uh, Premier League uh, club but Luton and of course with Tom Lockyer as well was also a, a situation they had to deal with during the season um, and I thought they could have won and I'm sure Rob Evers is thinking this now the games that could have been won, the points that slipped away, the late goals, the leads, and obviously the Bournemouth away game was um, you know, a staggering dereliction of duty in that second half, really. Um, whether they would have got enough points had they been able to win those marginal matches, I think they, they would have done. And I think they would, in a way, their approach for a very small club with a small ground uh, just shows the democracy of football is still there. It's not all about the, the elite teams and all the European uh, 
chasing for European places, I, I, I think they represented. They were in the National League. I saw them lose at um, the Etihad to AFC Wimbledon. When AFC Wimbledon got in the league, then that playoff final, they beat Luton, who stayed in the National League um, that, with that defeat that day. And so from there to what we've seen this season is, is just a quantum leap. And um, they'll come again, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and also uh, the Adebayo was playing centre forward uh, mm. and took a while to adapt to the Premier League and then started banging in goals left, right and centre. And was a, I thought he was a good player. He was certainly a, a very good Luton player and then he got injured. In 2019, Neil, in the second round of the FA Cup, Woking, where I was coaching, we played Swindon away and we won 1-0. And a sub that day was Elijah Adebayo was on loan at Swindon at the time and he came on and, and we were one nil up and he couldn't change that particular game so I saw Mick Harford who's a long time friend for both of us um, at a Woking game quite recently and I told him that story and he says well you just need to get a chance and the boys done really and for Mick to say he's done well who was a, a Premier League striker an England striker um, and who, who came from very humble origins himself uh, Lincoln City, where was, I think it was his first league club. So, um, yeah, it's about opportunity. He's taken this opportunity and having seen him that day and now seeing him what he can do in the Premier League, I hope he gets the chance to stay in the Premier League because he's worked so hard to get there. And that's part of it. I, I've always said to you in this, this podcast, the backstories of players are so fascinating. Yeah, we, we love the the tactical battles and the big timers and how they but there's so many human stories lower down uh, I'll just throw one in here about somebody that you you know Mason Mount won the FA Cup finally for Manchester United he played for two minutes I think and looked a little bit embarrassed when he um, when he was asked to hold the cup up and got having lost three finals in a row for Chelsea and lost a, an England final at Wembley as well and the playoff final with Derby Charlie, County as yeah. well, and and for Mason it probably doesn't count too much. I would say it's brilliant. You're stuck in there. You've had a pretty tough two years, and you've now got you on that. That's in the history books. That's in the history books. You are a FA Cup winner. Take it. Enjoy it. Two minutes, it could have been the whole 90 minutes on another day and another time in your career. It's happened. Enjoy. Yeah, and, and I understand Chelsea got another £5 million pounds for that. So it's, so he's enjoyed it yeah, as well. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to tell a quick Mick Harford story. Now, Mick Harford, for people who didn't watch football in the 1980s, wasn't just technically a very good centre forward with not a lot of pace, but was the hardest man in football. And actually, off the pitch, was the hardest man in football. He, was, he probably he, still is the hardest man yeah, in football he's, even today. He's a brilliant, brilliant <laughs> bloke. Yeah. Uh, but he, he went to Wimbledon, uh, the old crazy gang mm. Wimbledon. And Wimbledon were playing at Stamford Bridge. Uh, and Dennis Wise uh, was, was having... an. Dennis Wise was Chelsea at this stage, not Wimbledon, was having an on-pitch battle with someone that he didn't like very much, I can't remember who, and it went off after the game down the tunnel and there was a mass bundle down the tunnel. As there used to be. Uh, and and uh, Jean-Luc Viali was manager of Chelsea at the time and even he got knocked over in this bundle. But Mick Harford had been out on the pitch uh, and was just coming in and there were people lying on the ground uh, uh, either being knocked down or, or fighting on the ground and Mick walked up the tunnel and as he walked up the tunnel he just walked on everybody who was lying on the ground and made sure they lay there for a little bit longer Mick was not impressed with people who finished up on the floor no. <laughs> great no. great player um, so Luton now Burnley um, did they try and play football too much or when their players weren't good enough? Did they lack edge or were they just unlucky? Forster started the season well and then had uh, fitness issues. Uh, were they... Why didn't it work? Uh, well, I think they, were, they put a lot of faith in a young goalkeeper, which is always a dangerous thing to do. A very, More coming up on that. A very good young goalkeeper in James Trafford. But I think the opposition and you, you you don't get any time to really work on your game at that level you are found out right at the beginning and there was a way of making him look uncertain which contributed to Burnley losing some games um, all credit to Vincent Company people everybody's now saying oh you should have changed it you should have changed it but 
you know, why, if you believe that's the way football should be played, why should you change him? Would you have stayed up? He knows his players. Possibly not. He certainly had somebody who was super competitive alongside him in Craig Bellamy and would have worked hard on trying to win every game, that's for sure. So they, they've yo-yoed before um, and I, I'm sure they'll, they'll come back again, but obviously under, under different leadership this time. I think the one, Sheffield United, I understand that even before a ball was kicked, there was ructions around the club. Um, Sander Berger, one of their best players, was sort of sold under the nose of manager Paul Heckingbottom, who was in charge then, right, right before the first game, to, and sold to Burnley, actually. Uh, and one or two others went, and there was no financial stability. It was always going to be an impossible task to keep them up. And I think Chris Wilder's come in, reverting back to um, they, in reverse it was Chris Wilder and Paul Hegging but last time they were in the Premier League those same two managers did it this time around in reverse order but Chris is a, he's a blade through and through and through and, and he will be given every chance I'm sure to, to sort it out and you can't sort it out during the season I mean the, the first 20 minutes they, they had against Arsenal I was at Bremer Lane when Arsenal were four up I think uh, showed the difference of what they were up against and there was never a way and never, you know, un, uh, one or two individual players did better than perhaps before. Ollie McBurney actually was, became quite an effective Premier League striker in and out, but it wasn't enough. And, and uh, Hama, Gustavo Hama, who signed from Coventry, the Brazilian, he did uh, well. He looked as though he was set for, but they didn't have enough of those players really. So no, no one in Sheffield is saying um, we didn't do anything. We, we got what we deserved. So it's not a hard luck story at all. Uh, Ollie McBurney, one of three Premier League players to get sent off twice mm. this last season. He's the awkward. Other, the other, <laughs> the other two were Ipasuma at Tottenham and Rhys James at Chelsea, who hardly played. Yeah, that, that was extraordinary, wasn't it? <laughs> um, unbelievable. But, but uh, you know, they, they are, Sheffield, Sheffield's a tough city, and they've had tough times, and, uh, and they'll bounce back again. And I, I had those five years at Yorkshire Television that I was telling mm. you about, and a letter from the gantry. And there's a real resilience. They went to Sheffield United my last season, were relegated to the fourth tier. Yeah, well, Sheffield Wednesday only avoided relegation back to the third tier by three points. Yeah. Uh, and that was, a, that was a, a, an escape, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, escape. and I mean, Sheffield Wednesday, I think, got relegated from the Premier League about 99. Mm -hmm. um, but they were, I mean, in 93, they got to both cup finals and mm -hmm. I think finished in the top, I can't remember, but in the top five or something. And uh, but, but going right back, I mean, when I was growing up, they were runners up to Tottenham when Tottenham won the double in 1961. They, 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 they are a big club, no longer big. I saw them win 4 0 at Chelsea, Neil, so about around that time. Change of subject. <laughs> really? I don't remember. I did, yeah. yeah. Mm. That, that, that sort been. of team. They had a centre forward and they never, would never get a mention, but I, can I mention him here? Because he was brilliant in the air, and that's what I loved. You know, Ron Davis, one of my favourite mm. Southampton player, was probably my favourite player of all time. They had a centre forward called Keith Ellis, oh, who yeah. once scored a hat trick at Old Trafford for Sheffield Wednesday, and he scored with a header from the D in that four 0 win at Stamford Bridge. Yeah. And I, I just, I, it's a memory that I treasure personally. But when you're six foot three and tried to jump. Six foot eight, and you ended up jumping five foot eleven. <laughs> that was a bit of a problem. That um, wasn't Keith. That was me. <laughs> uh, those were the three clubs that got promoted to the Premier League a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the three who get promoted this year will all go down. Well, I hope not, season. because it's the yeah. first time for a long time that's yeah. happened. Yeah, it's not something that we should think. But if it, it becomes a trend, then you would start to worry about it. Yeah, I, I don't think it will happen. Have. Okay, uh, and I think one. That uh, manager who deserves great credit who's not included in all this is Gary O'Neill at Wolves uh, he hasn't been mentioned today but he of course uh, took over when Lopetegui walked out of Wolves on mm. the last week I think before the season began so he mm. didn't even get pre-season and somehow got Wolves uh, to 14th position on 46 points mm. uh, with, uh, with without it being VAR, team. they might have got 66 yeah, points with that. Yeah, so well done. <laughs> That's what he thinks, yeah, anyway. Well done to them and well yeah. done to him. Yeah, that abso was absolutely. Okay. And we praised, I mean, Everton is an amazing story as well. And Sean Dyche has had plenty of praise in this mm. podcast. But that will be a, a season from hell. And they've, they've survived it. And yeah. The only thing I want to finish with this on is, is 
I don't understand the way these clubs, a lot of these clubs are run. Uh, and, and we go back to the director of football talk at the beginning. And I, I take as my two examples, Everton and Leeds. Because a couple of years ago, Frank Lampard in charge of Everton avoided relegation on the penultimate game of the season. At the end of the season, they sold their best player, Richarlison, to Tottenham and then wondered why they were in a relegation fight the following season. Well, you just sold your best player, that's why. Mm. Then Leeds United, I think that same season, under Jesse Marsh, having got rid of uh, Marcelo Bielsa, avoided relegation on the last day of the season and then sold their two best players, Rafinha to Barcelona and Calvin Phillips to Manchester City and then wondered why they were in the relegation battle the following season. If you keep selling your best players, that's what happens. Look out, Brighton. OK, right. Um, let's go on from our one-off, three of the best, three of the worst, to... Our standard three of the best. And he makes them pay. Three. <laughs> right. Um, your young player. Well, there are two. And it's an obvious one this week. Um, uh, Kobe Maino and Alejandro Ganacho, who made history. The first two teenagers to score in an FA Cup final. An extraordinary thing in itself. 143rd FA Cup final. And the first time that we've had teenagers, Cristiano Ronaldo, Norman Whiteside, that's Manchester United alone. Um, I go back to, um, I think, Johnny Sissons for West Ham back in the 60s was a teenager when he scored and they won the FA Cup. So, And the youngest at that stage in that game, the youngest player to play in a cup final played, West Ham versus Preston. And the commentator, I was at home, I went to quite a few cup finals in the 60s, but the commentator that day did not get on my nerves. It wasn't you. Because every time that Howard Kendall touched the ball, he said, the youngest player ever to play in an FA Cup final. And then we had Paul Allen, Curtis Weston, people, but these are goal scorers we're talking about. And, and in a way, it represents so much of uh, Manchester United have had a lot of bad press, and rightly so. It's not acceptable for, for their fans, for the club, the ownership. We know all about that. But it did ring true because you know I, I grew up in the 50s the Busby Babes and obviously I, I was uh, alive when the, um, the awful crash happened and it just shocked everybody you know, with, did you actually ever see Duncan Edwards play only on the television but he was extraordinary he could play anywhere absolutely anywhere. he played up front for England and he was in the old money a wing half really but he played up front for occasionally for club and, and, and occasionally for country. He was a colossus. And as this, many people have said, had, had Duncan survived, um, then Bobby Moore would not have been the person that we refer to with England. Duncan would have played for, oh gosh, for years and years and years, would have broken all the Caps records. And it was, it was an awful time, but it, it was, I, I'm you know, going back to it because it, so many young young players' lives were lost, but so many young careers were forged at Manchester United. And here we've got two that they have developed their own. Last season, I think, um, when they lost to Manchester City in the final a year earlier, Garnacho came on as a sub. Maynard was never even heard of then. So he's come um, come to the fore. He scored, uh, I think he scored in the, in the Liverpool game, didn't he, as well. So they, they've had um, a, an amazing, amazing season, really, the two youngsters. And to uh, round it off like that, in a game where they weren't supposed to win, um, and that it, it, it was the, the old DNA, that, if you like, the total DNA of Manchester United was represented by those two goal scorers, um, even if the, um, the, the current problems for the club about overshadowed everything. Even now, uh, is that going to be enough to keep Ten Hag in the job? I mean, it was an amazing coaching display from them. They followed the letter. City had a bad day, of course, they would have to. Um, Pep didn't wear his lucky sweater. So <laughs> everything worked in maybe United's favour. But those two lads, that's history. I, you know, I've done a lot of cup finals and I love the history of that particular competition. So to see it, we had um, the, the quickest goal last year, didn't we, from Gundogan yeah. and, and these two teenagers. So... It goes on and on, another page in the record books, and, and well done, those two. Uh, I, I, there was, um, I didn't go to the cup final, I watched it on television, and BBC did a, 
wonderful uh, piece on my new beforehand, including an interview, and just what a really mature young person yeah. uh, he seems well, to be. He be. wasn't a stranger to Wembley, was he? He played for England yeah. already, and mm. this is his first season. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just amazing. And maybe more to come as we head for the Euros. Yeah. Um, uh, very quick story. I think it was Frank Blunstone, an old winger who's now in his 80s, uh, told me uh, that Chelsea played Manchester United in an FA Youth Cup game at Stamford Bridge in the 1950s uh, and Duncan Edwards played up front and I think the score at half time was 4-2 to United and that he'd been involved in all four goals and uh, at half time they came out and Duncan Edwards was playing centre half mm -hmm. in the second half and Chelsea didn't score again oh, yeah. and, and United no, won so. he, a Colossus yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. great uh, loss great loss um, brilliant uh, my young players I'm, I'm I'm sorry on the joy of football to be a negative, uh, but my young players are a bunch of goalkeepers uh, who I think have been put in to the firing line too soon. Um, uh, Gavin Buzana. Buzuna. 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 Thank you. Buzuna. Buzuna. Yeah. Buzuna. Gavin Buzuna, uh, I thought, uh, didn't have... Um, a Premier League quality season for Southampton last season uh, and and was probably one of the major reasons that they went down. Uh, James Trafford, 22 years old, James Trafford signed age 21, well, he's 21 now, so signed age 20 uh, by Vincent Company for Burnley, just wasn't ready for the Premier League, absolutely no way. Uh, and And... It's just asking too much. You can't throw people in before they've learnt their, learnt their trade. And I'd even go back to Ilan Melia, the Leeds goalkeeper, uh, who was uh, 23, I think, last summer. So he was 22 at the beginning of the previous season when they got relegated. And I know a lot of Leeds people think he's a really good goalkeeper, but... But the mistakes count, and you can't keep he did, making he did the play mistakes. In the seasons that they survived in the Premier League, yeah, he did. And he did. He was in the team towards the end of that promotion season. Yeah, well. but he's, he wasn't Premier League quality. You cannot make mistakes. Now, my hero, the great Peter Bonetti, once said to me that good goalkeepers make as often make as many great saves as great goalkeepers, but great goalkeepers make them at crucial times. Well, not so good goalkeepers make their mistakes at crucial times and and that happens with kids and i just do not believe that you can uh throw a youngster in between the sticks i, I, I did um i did a program uh when i was on sirius xm uh in the states and canada i did one with glenn murray the old brighton uh, uh legend and i said to him, I just feel that when a team gets promoted, and he got promoted a few times, that, that the best thing you can do is get a goalkeeper or win you 10 points a season, a goal scorer, not, not a quality centre forward, a goal scorer will win you 10 points a season. And then the other nine players only need to win you uh, 20 points. Now, Brighton were a wonderful example of that when they came up because they had the Australian goalkeeper, um, Matt Ryan Matt Ryan who definitely was winning them 10 points a season and Glenn Murray who was winning them 10 points a season and that's how under Chris Hutton at the beginning that they stayed up and, and, and established themselves in the Premier League and I look at these teams and they're doing the opposite you know I mean people forget now when Nottingham Forest in 1977 were promoted and won the old first division the following season in 1978 they bought arguably the best goalkeeper in Europe, Peter Shilton, mm. uh, uh, to, to play that season. Uh, um, and, and you have to have someone who's going to win you points, not lose you points. And I'm not saying any of these goalkeepers are not going to be top, top goalkeepers. I'm saying, what are you doing putting the kid in goal when you're going to be under pressure all that time? You need someone, you need someone who, who's learnt the game. Well... The problem is finding somebody of the caliber of Peter Shilton in a market that's now reduced, whereby Nottingham Forest, in equal bidding, really, back in the late 1970s, could go for a, a top player. 
Whereas now the resources are the very, very best. Well, they've bought the three international goalkeeper. goalkeepers this season. Mm-hmm. They'd have been better off buying one of better quality <laughs> because they haven't settled with any of them. Uh, Matt Turner, the USA goalkeeper, now pronounced to me the Greece goalkeeper. Um, Vladikomis. Uh, Vladokimos. Vlad, Vladokimos. Vladokimos, yeah. the Greek goalkeeper. And Matt, Cels, Matt Cels, yeah. who is in the Belgian squad, but Courtois isn't. Yeah. I wonder if Cels would be if Courtois was. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So this is called Three of the Best. So we've just um, had a slightly different take on that. Yeah, uh, well, uh, it's get the best is what I'm saying. Uh, uh, don't muck about. Now, let's go to your old player. Well, that's Vincent Company because I'm... Delighted that he's got another chance in top-level management at um, Bayern Munich. I know he was, they say, eighth choice. I'm not quite sure how accurate that is, but certainly he wasn't the first choice. Um, and clearly, uh, he's been recognised for the philosophy that he brings, the type of football that he plays, and he'll have better players to work with. And I think um, one great aspect of Vincent, and anybody who's met him would back this up, he's a man of dignity, a man of integrity, and I think those are important qualities. And that is, um, yeah, he, he would have wished for a different season, a different backdrop to going to Bayern. But that's been the, the powers that be there. And, and goodness me, that is a club that knows how to run a football club. Um, they've seen him as the, the person to take charge of a, what can be a disparate group of um, Galacticos at times. And not always a team that's had a very poor season by its own standards and that he can get them going again. It'll be fascinating. I think we're all really looking forward to seeing what he does with the, the, um, the better cast of players that he's got. Um, and I wish him well because he's whatever. In, I thought in defeat, and he had a lot of defeats to deal with. He spoke very eloquently. Um, he never really um, sort of blamed anybody but himself. And I say that those qualities of the personality that he's got deserves some, to have some success at the highest level. And I, I think he, they know him from Germany. He's played a bit in Germany in his playing career. So I think he'll, I think he'll do well. Um, yes, maybe a bit fortunate to get the chance, but I'm sure he'll take it. Yeah, and, and centre-backs. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the great centre-backs, Vincent mm-hmm. Company, but, but they are, it, Bayern Munich uh, seem to be very confused on their policy. Uh, directors of football, whoever you are, on centre backs and and uh, successive managers have chosen different uh, well, they've, selections. They've, they've had the group. kind of problems we were talking about earlier with mm. directors of football and managers and well, head coaches, as they would call them, falling out. And it is a structural defect. You know, if you didn't mm. have that layer there, then this wouldn't happen. No. And and the mm. head coaches would manage. And uh, stand or fall by their own decisions, mm. not somebody else's. Um, my old player is a goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alex McCarthy came into the Southampton team for uh, Bazunu. Yeah, Bazunu, who, got, who got injured. Yeah, who got he he did his Achilles in a warm up. Now, if you didn't watch the game on telly, you won't you won't have heard uh, that uh, in April, April the sixteenth. In the morning of Saturday, April the 16th, he was, sh- or I think it was an evening game actually, it might have been a midweek game. He was shopping in London with his wife. He wasn't on the bench even, he was third choice. Um, he was sitting in the stand for the game uh, when the injury happened in the warm up. But uh, Russell Martin decided to go with experience, 34 year old McCarthy over Joe Lumley, who was on the bench. He came in, he played the last eight games of the season which would be the last five league games and then the, th- the three playoff games and he we come back to uh, play, goalkeepers make saves the better goalkeepers make saves at critical moments and he made a save at a critical moment where he parried a shot away and it was it was it was a good save because he parried it well away it was a proper goalkeeper's in the save. final you talking yeah. about he'd already done um, some heroics in the two legs of the playoff semi final yeah. so. and and Alex McCarthy someone who has um, spent a lot of time at Southampton spent some time in the England squad won a couple of caps for England mm. got a few grey hairs now Um, But I think he's done more than enough to say, pick me in the Premier League, I'll win you 10 points next season, 
Make sure you've got someone up front who can win you 10 points. And let's but his give contract it is up as we speak. We mm -hmm. don't know the outcome of that, whether he's done enough or whether he wants another contract to be possibly the backup goalkeeper at Southampton. There's talk of Celtic with Joe Hart having called time. Also talk of Liverpool, who are looking for some extra competition for Alisson. So I think the future is very bright for Alex McCarthy. And at 34, he's still quite young for a goalkeeper, really, isn't he? Um, but he's always been solid. He, he did play for my club, Woking, a couple of times when he was on loan. He started at Reading and um, he got some National League experience in, in that time. So we were always very grateful, us non-league fans, to say hey, he played for us once or twice. And had I been commentating on the, uh, on the Southampton <laughs> playoff final rather than just watching it, that would have got a mention, I promise you. <laughs> Um, right, uh, your player. Yeah, well, it is on the Southampton theme. Um, Jack Stevens, who captained them at Wembley, who cost £150,000 when he was 17 years old from Plymouth. He's a West Country boy. And he, he was um, certainly tipped for very high level. I mean, he got as far as England under 21. Yeah, I remember playing for them. In the, in the course of the England under 21 setup. He, um, I was asked by um, uh, A.D. Boothroyd, who was the manager then, to go and speak to the, before a tournament, to speak to the under-21 squad uh, about media, you know, how best to handle the media. And, and some were very, very interested and liked to talk to the media, like Tammy Abraham, you know, from, from Chelsea. I remember him being there. Damari Gray, another one. Um, but Jack Stevens said to me, I don't want to do any media. So he was just a squad member. And I was chuckling away because he, as he held up the trophy. I thought, you're going to have to do all the media. Was you know, captain, he was appointed <laughs> captain when James Woodprouse left for West Ham and then immediately got injured and then didn't play, I think, from August to December. Um, but has got himself back in the team. He was, uh, he was immense in the game. And he didn't get relegated because he was on loan at Bournemouth. So of course, his club got relegated, his parent club. So he was away while, um, while the, uh, the collapse of that season happened. And so now he's back and he, I, I, I guess um, yeah, 30 years old. He's still got plenty of um, good football at a high level in him. So, yeah, well done, Jack. Yeah, yeah, lovely story. Uh, my player is Ayub El Kabi. Uh, the Moroccan striker who scored the winning goal in the uh, Europa Conference final for Olympiacos uh, against Fiorentina. Um, it, it, First Greek club yeah. to win a trophy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which we talked about last week. But in mm. fact, as I pointed out last week, Olympiacos won the UEFA Youth League this mm. year. Uh, so it's an absolutely fantastic year for that club. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. It was one in Athens, but not at their ground. I think it was AK Athens. Well, they play in Piraeus. They play in Piraeus. a distinct yeah, where Panathinaikos play. Yeah. And, and in fact, the only Greek club European finalist before uh, this season was Panathinaikos, who at reached Wembley. the European Cup final at Wembley in 1971. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was, there was a real bond that season because Panathinaikos played at Wembley against Ajax in the European Cup final, and Chelsea played against Real Madrid in Piraeus at Panathinaikos' yeah. ground uh, in the European Cup Winners' Cup final. So Chelsea and, and Panathinaikos bonded. Panathinaikos lost to Ajax, but Chelsea beat Real Madrid. Um, so, uh, um, so we're not just a rich club the, the story of um, this striker is amazing, oh, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he's, he's 30 years old. Mm -hmm. He scored more goals in Europe than any other player uh, this last season, but it's not considered a uh, golden boot, I don't think, because, because uh, the top five leagues, the goals are valued more, which he's is got, He's scored 11 European goals, yeah. five against Aston Villa. Yeah. In the semi final. Yeah, hat trick away at, yeah. uh, at Villa Park. Mm. Um, but he's 30 years old. Uh, he was born in a very uh, poor suburb of Casablanca. Uh, he left school at 15 because his family didn't have enough money. And he got a trade, and he's a qualified carpenter. And he didn't get his first professional contract, which was with a Casablanca team, until he was 21 years old. So he's a fantastic story. He was part of the Morocco team at the World Cup. Um, and he, he's played for them, but he wasn't first choice. And this was his moment. This was his moment. And, you know, I talked, we talked recently about that moment when Arsenal won the FA Cup and what it meant to Emiliano Martinez 
who who had come from such a, a deprived background uh, and the way he celebrated and this this was very similar really and and it was just a fantastic moment and uh, Ayub El Kabi is now a legend mm -hmm. in in Athens but it, more to the point he he is you talk about the pyramid and and this is just so important that that football can still prosper in this way and have stories like this and that uh, supporters can enjoy stories like this and it's not just one big super league uh, and and uh, everything else falls by the wayside because that's how the money goes around the quickest uh, well done Olympia the Olympia owner of course is the Nottingham Forest yes, owner yeah um, so so he's he's um, he was there in the celebrations, um, and uh, fortunately for him, um, from the Olympiacos point of view, Nottingham Forest haven't qualified for Europe. Mm -hmm. But there are clubs, of course, that have this issue with ownership, um, like Manchester United and Nice, for example. To go back to where we started yeah. this conversation, though Sir Jim Ratcliffe says that's going to be sorted out. We we'll wait to see in Manchester City and Girona sure. yeah. as well. Um, yeah, City's ownership is forty-seven percent of Girona. So, mm. but yeah, how do you UEFA deal with that? Yeah, absolutely intriguing. Uh, Ayub El Kabi, a legend of football. Um, right, that's it. Apart from stoppage time. Stoppage time. Well, I uh, thought that was stoppage time. Well, I'm going to bring the Euro, <laughs> the Euro Conference final is my stoppage time because. Uh, it's the third year of the competition. It was won in the first year by Roma and the second year by West Ham. And now it's been won by Olympiacos, as we said, the first ever Greek team to, to win a European trophy. Uh, but it's also the first time that a club from outside the big four, England, Spain, Italy, Germany, has won a European trophy since Porto did uh, won the Europa League in 2011. Uh, which, if you remember, I mean, this shows how long ago it was. It was the first year of Andre Villas Boas in management. He won the Portuguese League and the Europa League, uh, and got a job at Chelsea as a result. Um, but but uh, it, it's just such a great achievement, and and UEFA come in rightly for an awful lot of criticism, but this introduction of the Europa Conference. Is, has been a real winner for me uh, because it's just given supporters the chance to follow their teams in Europe, have a great time, and for three clubs who don't win trophies often, and in the case of Olympiacos have never won a European trophy, obviously West Ham won the European Cup Winners' Cup in 1965, uh, and two goals for Alan Seeley, I seem to remember. Uh, and Roma, had they? I think they won one European trophy before. Um, I'm not even sure if they'd won one. I don't know the history well, of But the Roma. Cup Winners' Cup, of course, was the third competition, really. Yeah. So for many years, certainly a big portion of my career, there have been three European yeah, competitions. Yeah. But they, many of the Cups were won by the teams that were winning. In Once you could get into the Champions League by not being the league champion, it worked when it was clearly one club for the Champions League or the European Cup as it was then. So the cup winners were invariably a different club. So now that that was, I think, rightly spotted by UEFA to be out of date. So they've come up with a, a format. It's a nice word, the conference. Uh, it may, reminds me of the National League. It, it just shows in the football vocabulary it has more than one meaning. Um, and, and the competition has been terrific. And, and we do see different teams. Um, the television coverage is uh, wall to wall, and uh, the finals. Obviously, poor Fiorentina <laughs> have copped it two years in a row. But and they've won a, lost a domestic final as well in that time. So yeah, three, and, and it would have been nine clubs in Europe for Italy had yeah, they won it, yeah. which uh, would have been an extraordinary and they, achievement. Their coach itself. Vincenzo and Italiano. Mm -hmm. uh, from Italy, Italiano, mm -hmm. uh, is somebody considered to be one going towards the top, but it, it's been a bit of a, it's been a bit of a bounce on his career. But I'm it's sure a bit of a European pyramid, and we praise our mm -hmm. pyramid. Obviously, it goes down to more humble origins, but it does give the other countries and the uh, the so-called lesser teams um, a real 
place in the sun, you know, and it was a, it was a fantastic night. Of course, people say, oh, well, it was in almost in Perez. It was mm. it was a, 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 almost a home game, um, but they play those games away, and they're probably the most hostile games yeah. that they play I, away from home. There, I think Olympiacos. it's really important, and this is what I want to stress. Uh, the game of football is the global game. It is an absolute global game, but it doesn't mean that it has to be run globally and it doesn't mean that it has to make uh, uh, global attractions everywhere it's played. Mm -hmm. The whole meaning of the word global is that it is enjoyed globally at every level and participated in globally at every level. And I know from my time of broadcasting uh, uh, in the USA... Uh, although I did it from here, they have no interest in the Europa Conference. They won't have even known about that final, probably. They have no interest in the Europa League. Their interest is the Champions League, and that's why so many Americans believe in the Super League. But globally, most people, I believe, don't believe in the Super League. They believe in the culture of the community, in the culture of their local team, in the culture of... Being involved in football. It's not about taking the game out of its community and playing it somewhere else. It's about following the game in its community. By all means, come and join us. But you join the club in its community. You don't take it out. It's not a business. Olympiakos, you have done magnificently. I've just got to say, in 2018-19, I followed Chelsea home and away in every round of the Europa League up to the final. I didn't go to the final in Baku. I wasn't going to pay that kind of money to go to Chelsea versus Arsenal <laughs> in, in a, a city that I've been to for a Champions League game uh, 18 months before. I just thought it was ludicrous. Uh, you, that's why UEFA come in for so much criticism. You missed out, though. What, 4-1 against Arsenal? <laughs> I watched it in a pub at Stamford Bridge, actually. Uh, but but the, the point is, the football was terrible. The football was terrible. Uh, we played, uh, we played, Palk Thessaloniki. We played Vidi, the Hungarian team, which was their their sponsors. I don't even know. I can't remember which time old team it was. We played Bati Borisov. My one time in Belarus. Uh, then we played Malmo in Sweden. Um, Dinamo Kiev, which was then Dinamo Kiev, as far as I was concerned. Uh, Slavia Prague in the quarterfinals and I can remember leaving the ground in Prague and turning around to the people I was with and saying that is the first team in this competition who would have given Huddersfield a game who were currently bottom of the Premier League at that stage so the football was awful but but the occasions were fantastic the trips were fantastic watching the these people we'd never seen play was fantastic and that Football has roots. Do not kill the roots. Europa Conference celebrates roots. This is called the joy of football. As somebody who's operated in a parallel universe to my commentary career in non-league football, I think Neil's talking through his backside because the football isn't awful. The football is relatively different to his snobbiness of watching a Premier League team over and over again, a, a team that hasn't been out of the Premier League at all, a team that's won trophies, a team that's brought in the most expensive players, the most expensive managers, of course relative. If you've been like I have at East Thurrock United on a wet Tuesday with a team that gets beaten 2-0, and that's, that's football where you can challenge the nature of it, the, what we've seen in the Europa Conference or the Europa League has been very good, but not quite as perfect to satisfy Neil Barnett. I'm speaking for the rest of us. I'm the voice of reason. He can speak from the elite because he supports an elite club and he's entitled to that opinion. But there are various shades here. And um, I, I have seen some bad football. I've put some players on the pitch that are not perhaps worthy of the name of being footballers. But we've always tried to win. We've always tried to entertain. There's always been people who paid to come in, even when I was playing, um, which uh, was a great sense of responsibility. It was only one sub. And if you got subbed, as I often was, for that one sub, then you knew you'd had a bad day. So that was, that was bad football. 
Neil, it's all relative. We love it. We do love it. We do talk about the joy of football because that's why we're here and that's why we're grateful for your support. Don't take him too seriously on that subject. That's all I would say. But take us seriously and come back and see us again. And always remember, the test is, can you do it at East Thurrock on the Tuesday night? <laughs> and I've heard that East Thurrock can't do it at East Thurrock. Uh, that's on very Tuesday. unfair on a very noble non-league team. Um, but I can definitely remember our goalkeeper letting the ball under his foot from a back pass. And I was the only one watching from the coaches because the others were all seeing where he was going to kick the ball upfield. And that moment will live with me till I pass away. <laughs> Uh, which will be a very, very long time. Uh, from everybody, thanks for watching. From Martin and me. Yeah, have a good one. Ta-ra. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening or watching. Don't forget you can go on the Patreon and get involved in everything backstage in the Joy of Football and you can contact us. Well, you can leave a message on YouTube, but you can contact us in more length on the email, the Joys plural. The Joys of Football Podcast at gmail.com. And otherwise, just keep enjoying this brilliant game.